Let me be blunt. You're not very sharp. In fact, you are quite dull. Yeah, I know you think you're cutting deep, but you're not. You're just scratching the surface. You think you're well-rounded, and that's the problem. You couldn't cut butter on a hot August afternoon. You need to work on your sharpening skills. Hi, my name is Roger Kugler. This is Working at Woodworking Podcast, episode number 94, Improving Your Sharpening Skills. I'm here to encourage you, the skilled amateur, DIYer, weekend warrior, whatever nomenclature you want to, to use, to take your skills to the next level, to turn professional, to make some money, to help out your community by fixing Mrs. Smith's rocking chair or any other needs that are out there every single day. You can do this full-time. You could do this part-time. You could do it on weekends. You can do it in the evenings. But one of the things you're going to really have to work on is how well you sharpen your tools. Oh, boy. Here we go. And in this corner, all the way from Japan, costing $250, wearing the striped shorts, Waterstone! And in this corner, hailing from Marlboro, Massachusetts, at 176 USD, wearing all gray, Die Sharp! Yeah, if I was going to start a woodworking club, which I never would because I would never be a member of a club that I was a member of, I would have a membership ritual that would be a sharpening demo. Every new member would have to demonstrate how they sharpen tools. Now, it could be a new member says, I don't know how to sharpen tools, that's why I joined a woodworking club. Perfectly fine, but for every 10 demonstrations, you will learn 12 different ways to sharpen. I know, you've gone to YouTube, how do I do this? Well, good luck with that. I'm not going to call it disinformation, but I'm just going to call it mass hysteria. There are so many different ways to sharpen that if you're not really careful, you will never learn to sharpen by watching YouTube videos. Not that they're all bad, but caveat, they can be very, very confusing. So before we really dive in, we need to ask a few questions. Who sharpens tools? Is it only the hand tool woodworker? Or what about the hybrid woodworker, those who use hand tools and power tools? Or is it only the power tool woodworkers who sharpen tools, i.e. sending your table saw blades off to a professional sharpening surface? Well, everyone sharpens. Every woodworker sharpens tools. And I don't know any power tool woodworkers who don't have a set of bench chisels. So we all need to learn to sharpen. Why? Why do we sharpen? Well, to me, I think the number one reason is just pure safety. A sharp tool is safer than a dull tool. Well, that doesn't quite make sense. Well, in a lot of people's minds, mothers, <clears throat> that does make sense. Because if you had a sharp tool, you might cut yourself. I guarantee that if you have a dull tool, you are most definitely going to cut yourself. Why? Because you're going to struggle. You're going to need to use more force to get this dull butter knife blade to go through wood. And inevitably, you're going to slip. And that's where accidents happen. A sharp knife, you use less force. You have more control over that edge tool 
and you're just safer with it. I know it's a hard thing for mothers to kind of wrap their, their, their mind around. The second reason, efficiency. Sharp tools just work better. You don't have to expend as much energy. You don't have accidents either by bleeding all over your workpiece or ruining your workpiece whenever this thing goes skittering across, leaving a great big gouge. And I think there's just a, just a satisfaction of using a sharp tool. I mean, it's just, it's just satisfying. So what is sharp? Well, I've always maintained in the classes that I teach on sharpening that sharp is the intersection between two planes or two surfaces. You know, woodworkers work well, wood, and we cut wood with sharp edge tools. Sometimes we might use an axe. We generate tremendous force. We pick that axe up, we swing it in behind us, we create an arc up over our head and we bring that axe down on this log that we're trying to buck and chips just go flying. There's a tremendous amount of force that's generated when using an axe to cut down a tree or to buck a tree in half. But sometimes we use a mortise chisel and we pick up a mallet and we just start beating that thing. Boom, boom, boom. And it slowly moves through that end grain and we keep at it long enough and we create a mortise that you can then insert tenon into. Mortise and tenon joint. Or we use a smoothing plane. This is where we take those gossamer thin shavings. We use our whole body. Our feet are firmly planted on the shop floor. Powerful leg and back muscles propel our upper body forward. Strong arms connect this kinetic chain to the hand plane. And the wood just peels off in shavings measured to a thousandth of an inch. Or we might use a paring chisel. You know, one of those really thin chisels, usually very long, that has this wickedly sharp edge on it that we just nudge our wrist a little bit and a sliver of wood lifts off and our joint fits perfectly. So do all these tools have the same degree of sharpness? Do they all have the same geometry? Are the angels the same? Angels. Who wrote this? Are the angles the same? To answer these questions, we need to figure out what sharp is. So, what is sharp? What do we as woodworkers concentrate on? What is our goal? Well, to quickly and with as little effort as possible, create an intersection between two planes sufficiently sharp to accomplish the task at hand. So is the axe as sharp as a paring chisel? No. We might sharpen an axe to, you know, 220 grit off of a file or maybe a stone. Maybe we go to 320. Will it benefit if we take it to 600 or maybe 1,000? Yeah, maybe. For a couple strokes anyway. And then that edge is going to break down become more dull, probably back to about 220, because there's so much force involved. Would we sharpen our paring chisel to 320? No way. Nope. Not going to happen, because it just wouldn't accomplish the job that we're asking it to do. Namely, oftentimes, cut in grain. So... How do we accomplish this sharpening? Well, there's two ways of doing it. You can take the blue pill and machine sharpen. This would be in the form of like a Tormac machine. You know, one of those great big beasts that sits on a workbench, has like an inch and a half thick wheel on it, very slow speed. I mean, like fall asleep, slow speed. And there's a water bath. The stone is rotating through water. The water gets picked up. 
you're not going to burn tools on a Tormac machines. Just cannot happen. Are they good? Yeah, for some people, they would be perfectly wonderful. 500 bucks for the low-priced model or the T8s running around $900. Beautiful machine. Or maybe you could take a look at the Rikon at Rockler. That's selling for around 170 right now. And, of course, there's the WorkSharp. This is a machine that uses a glass plate and sandpaper, and you hold your, your tool up to the sandpaper, and it spins and it sharpens it. And I've heard that it actually does a, a very good job. And recently released is the Taylor Drill Press Sharpener. Matt at 731 Woodworks did a very nice video describing how to use this. You know, he built it as the woodworking jig will change your tool sharpening forever. Link in the show notes. Now, I, I haven't included bench grinders into this because you don't use a bench grinder to sharpen tools. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. Stay with me. You use those to grind tools, to shape your tool's geometry, but you don't actually sharpen with them. Okay, maybe an axe, maybe a lawnmower blade, but not our woodworking tools. They're a shaping tool. And while we're talking about bench grinders, you know, if you don't have a bench grinder, but if you have a a six-inch stationary belt sander sitting over there, even one of the super El Cheapos from, you know, the big box stores or or the the store down by the harbor, you know, that works perfectly fine too. It's a, a, an abrasive belt, a sanding belt. And there's little difference between a sanding belt and an abrasive stone. So you can rig up all kinds of jigs. You can use it freehand to shape your tools before you start to sharpen your tools. Now, a word about overheating, losing your temper in your steel, not with your kids. Temper is the the cutting edge of the tool, the hardness of the tool that allows it to be hard and sharp and durable. And if we heat that steel up to around 400 degrees or over, we can lose that temper, that ability of the steel to stay sharp for a long time. And this is why the Tormac has a water bath to keep from you losing the temper or burning your tool, as some people will say. This is very easy to avoid. Very, very easy to avoid. You need a a container of water sitting right there beside your, your belt sander. And you need to realize that our fingers are very sensitive in fact, they can sense hot Isa, at about 140 degrees. That's when we let things go. That's when we don't want to touch them anymore. So if you're holding your tool with your fingers and you start feeling that tool getting warm, that's when you stop. And that's when you put it in the container of water, swish it around a little bit, take your fingers back out, feel the tool, it feels cool, you go back to shaping. You should never, ever, ever burn a tool using this technique. Caveat, if you're working on an edge, there's not much metal out there, and you can go from perfectly fine to burnt in a fraction of a second. So there you need to be very, very diligent on keeping that tool. You know, I even move my one finger, you know, right up there on that edge and the the least bit of heat that I feel, I go back and I quench. You should never burn a tool. You'll do it once and you'll really, you know, get mad at yourself because now you have to grind back into good temper to resharpen, to restore that edge and it's a major pain in the butt. And if you don't have really good steel to begin with, i.e. expensive tools, you may grind right out of the temper zone because it's a cheap tool and then you'll, well, you'll have to replace it or you'll have to retemper it. 
that's a very useful skill for woodworkers. We're not going to cover that here. So, in my feeble mind, there are three phases of sharpening tools. There's the shaping phase, i.e. using a grinder or a stationary uh, belt sander. There's the sharpening phase where we actually get a good sharp edge on the tool. And then there's the honing phase. That's where we make it shiny. In fact, maybe we could even say we shape, sharpen, and make it shiny. So should you use machines to sharpen? Yeah, if you want to, by all means. And if you have the money. Or maybe you'll choose the red pill and start sharpening by hand. So for sharpening by hand, we are using different grits of abrasives to wear away the metal until we can get two planes to meet at one molecule. Or maybe even at one atom. You know, at the subatomic level. Oh no, no, we, we don't want to go subatomic. This, this, this could blow up the show. The, we could melt down. The, the fallout would be terrible. Okay, sometimes I have too much fun. <laughs> I am so sorry. So, there you go. That's uh, sharpening wrapped up in, you know, one neat little ball. Hope that helps. Uh, Miss Jobs. Okay, okay. Let's talk about abrasives. All 20,000 of them. How do we get two planes of metal to come together at one molecule? <sighs> I know I'm going to piss some people off. You can use Japanese water stones. You can use man-made water stones. You can use diamond stones. You could use natural stones like Arkansas, India, Japanese. Ooh, there's hard Arkansas and there's soft Arkansas. Or there's translucent Arkansas. Maybe you are kind of into the oil stones. Carbide? Silicon carbide? Perhaps carborindium. Maybe you're one of those sandpaper people who kind of get off on aluminium oxide or ceramic sandpaper. Ooh, there's also quartz sandpaper. Now, I'm not going to drag you through each and every one of these. That's your job. Now, I would recommend not sponsored, hint, hint, to contact sharpeningsupplies.com. Wonderful website, very knowledgeable people working there. I've called them up several times, picked their brains. They're always willing to answer questions that I'm quite sure they get like a 100 times a day, but always friendly, always helpful. The only advice that I will give here is that whatever system you pick, you stay with it. And the golden rule, I think, is don't mix and match systems. You know, if you're into Japanese water stones, stay with that. If you're a diamond person, cool, stay with that. Don't buy a Japanese water stone and then use a soft Arkansas stone. And then try to f finish this up with an oil stone. There is very good chance that you will be doing the same grit three different times. This is where we get into grit nomenclature and grit confusion. What do I mean by grit? Okay, you all know that grit is the size of the particles that make up the abrasive. You can have really big grit, maybe, you know, a hundred grit, and you can have really itty bitty tiny grit, you know, like a thousand grit. But grit is not the end all be all because nobody really can agree on what size grits are. 
because you have an American grit system. You have a European grit system. You have a Japanese grit system. You have a mesh system. You have that system. If you go into the aggregates, oh my gosh, it just gets so confusing. The only thing that we really have that is uniform across all the scales is micron size. And a micron is a, a millionth of a meter. So if you have a hundred micron size particle, well, that's actually pretty big. You know, that's like a 150 grit U.S. sandpaper standard. And oftentimes, if you just go out to the big box store, you'll see sandpaper as extremely coarse, coarse, medium coarse, medium, medium fine, so on and so forth. What the heck does that mean? If you just take it on face value and you are trying to refinish you know, Mrs. Smith's rocker, you can figure out that you probably want to start off with maybe a coarse sandpaper to get the old finish off and then follow that with a, a medium and then go to a fine, you know, to right before you apply the stain and, and the finish. That works wonderfully. But being a professional woodworker, you probably want to dive a little bit more into this. Now, on... SharpeningSupplies.com, they have a whole bunch of, of information, articles, videos, and I really encourage you to dig into that. They have a grit chart. I have a grit chart, too. I call it True Grit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you would like a copy of mine where I've tried to summarize all the various standards. Um, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to, to email you a, a PDF of that. So if we start to evaluate different things based on our micron size instead of their grit size, we can kind of stay out of the weeds. Now, roughly speaking, a 60 micron would be equivalent to about a 220 grit. A 35 micron, which is almost half of the 60, is about a 400 grit. Now, if we get down to a 15 micron, we're talking about a thousand grit. And we can go much lower. That 2000 Japanese water stone, well, that's about eight microns. So what about that, that 10,000 grit stone that you've been looking at? That is crazy. Well, that's about two microns. And if you remember, I mentioned the three phases of sharpening, the shaping, the sharpening, and the honing, or making it shiny, that's where we're going to use some type of a honing compound. And now we're talking like a half a micron abrasive diameter to accomplish that. That's where you literally put a mirror finish on a piece of hard steel. Just absolutely phenomenal. So you have some homework I'm here to kind of inspire you, to kind of kick you in the butt a little bit to, you know, to learn this stuff because you really need to learn it and to practice it. And the only other thing I could add is what do I use? There's all these different options, you know, the oil stones, the natural stones, the Japanese water stones. Norton makes some fabulous manufactured water stones. There's water stones that you don't need water for anymore. I mean, it's just all over the place. A lot of this depends on your budget. Some of these things can get quite pricey, not as much as a Tormac system. And some things are actually kind of a bargain. And that's kind of what I fell into. Uh, I use DMT diamond stones. Yeah. Okay. Cue the applause. Yeah, there is no applause. Yeah, I, I use diamond stones and I use the, not the newer fancy ones that are bonded to this chunk of steel, but the old plastic matrix style. Why do I use these? Well, number one, 30 some odd years ago, I got a great price on them. I mean, I was working at a, at a retail store and I could use an employee discount. Woohoo! Yeah. I got a great price on those. Very, very good investment. And at the time, I was getting ready to jump on the Japanese Waterstone bandwagon. 
that was all the rage. And I thought about my three-year-old. Yeah, that's not going to work. So these plastic diamond stones, I mean, you could throw them across the shop and you'll probably chip concrete with them. They are just so incredibly durable. And they're also very low maintenance. There's no flattening. You know, you don't have to do any of that stuff. Occasionally, I throw them in the dishwasher when the wife's not home. Very easy keepers, very serviceable. And like I said, these things are like 30 years old. So look at all the different systems. Talk to the people at Sharpening Supplies. Uh, consult your priest uh, your, or your spiritual leader. You might want to ask your mother and certainly, you know, discuss this with your spouse. <laughs> I'm sorry. So once you have your system, your hand sharpening system nailed down, you, you need to make another choice. And this is, this is kind of a big one. And it really depends on your workshop. You can sharpen by hand or by jig. Yeah, I said that correctly. You can sharpen by hand or you can use a jig. Sharpening by hand. I think this is kind of the preferred method. This is the one that gives you all the ooh, ah, you know, and all the, that, the, the applause. But I believe that you really need to have a dedicated sharpening station to do this. Why? Because when we're sharpening by hand, we need to stay consistent in a straight line. But our hands are attached to these long appendages we call arms that rotate out of a shoulder socket. And with our hands, we can do all kinds of different motions. But the one motion that we struggle with with our hands is going in a straight line. You don't believe me? Pick up a pencil, draw a straight line. Now draw a square. It's a little challenging for us because our hands want to do curves because that's kind of the way they're designed. So the technique that I learned to do this is to have a sharpening station made so that when you're standing there and your arms are fully extended and you're you're grasping your chisel, your plain iron or whatever, your arms are fully outstretched. Now you can move your arms back and forth in a small range of motion, one, maybe two inches, and you don't introduce an arc in this motion because an arc will round over that flat beveled edge that we're trying to achieve. What are the advantages of this? Super fast. It's always there. There's no setup. You don't have to go find a thing in the drawer. And it's boom. I mean, you can literally seconds, you can restore an edge on a tool. In my shop, I don't have a place to have a dedicated sharpening system. So... I use a jig on the workbench. I store my stones in a drawer. I have one drawer dedicated to sharpening, and so I can pull that out. All of my DMT stones are mounted on a piece of wood. Uh, It's actually like a bench hook. It has a cleat so that once I put it down, it doesn't slide all over the place. In fact, I even put two uh, six-inch PSA, pressure-sensitive adhesive, uh, pieces of sandpaper on the underside so it actually grips my workbench and it never ever moves. I also use a jig because I can't accomplish that motion at the fully outstretched arms to minimize any type of arc. I have to use a jig to keep that bevel flat. Now, jigs. Oh my gosh. You can spend 15 bucks for the El Cheapy model that you can find almost any place, even on sharpeningsupplies.com. Uh, Veritas has a beautiful jig. It costs like a hundred bucks that once you get over the learning curve of figuring out what all the little things mean, does a marvelous job. The people who are hand sharpening, they don't use no stinking jigs. They feel the bevel 
lock that in, and go for it. And that's how I set up the, the jigs. The more expensive jigs get really, to me, they get really, really complicated. And so I just, you know, put the jig on the, the chisel, let's say, and feel the bevel, hold that, set the jig, and I start sharpening. Now, you can rig up a, like a little stop block that if you're sharpening to 25 degrees, that is a specific distance away from the edge that you need to set that gauge. And I've got the little stop block. I can just push it up there, set the, the gauge, boom. It takes like three seconds uh, to do that. If you are struggling with sharpening or if this is kind of new to you, this is really important. We overcomplicate sharpening tremendously. So when I'm sharpening, let's say, a new tool and a not terribly expensive tool, i.e. a tool that still has some mill marks on it because I didn't spend $400 to pay someone to take out the mill marks and put a razor sharp edge on this thing, I take out my, my 220 stone and I put a little bit of water on it. If I'm by myself, okay, I'll admit it, I just spit on it. And I start at the back, and I just sharpen about a half inch of that chisel on the back. Back and forth, 220, which is about a 60 micron. I go to the 325, about 45 micron. I go to the 25 micron and all the way up to the 9 micron, which is about 1,200. How do I know when I'm done with a 220 and moving to the next abrasive grit? I feel for a little burr, or some people will call this a wire. And what's happening is as you're abrading that metal on the stone, some of that metal curls up over the edge of the tool. That means that you've actually removed metal. And when you get that burr, you're done. Move on to the next stone. Each time you see or feel that burr, that wire, stop sharpening. You're done with that grit. Go on to the next grit. And you can just run your, 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 the palm of your hand over the edge and that will break that, that wire off. And so I do the entire back all the way up to my highest stone, which is like nine micron, 1200 grit. Then I turn the chisel over and I do the exact same thing on the bevel, working through each grit looking for that burr. How long does this take? It depends on the metal and the chisel. It might take a minute, maybe two minutes on the real outside if this was a super inexpensive chisel, but not very long. You know, I've heard of people sitting there for like 25 minutes on one grit. Oh my gosh, what are you doing? It doesn't take that long. Work until you get the burr. Stroke it off, move on to the next grit. So when you've moved all the way through to your highest grit on both the back and the bevel, now it's time to hone. Honing, 101. Honing is using a, an extremely fine abrasive to polish an edge. We do this by applying a honing compound, which is a basically a wax and abrasive mixture onto some type of honing surface. This could be a leather strop. This could be a piece of leather glued to a piece of wood. This could be a piece of wood, something even density, maybe maple, perhaps poplar, that we simply charge the strop with the honing compound. We use it as a crayon. You're rubbing it back and forth, applying that compound to the surface. Then we stroke or pull back on both the bevel and the back. And literally, we're talking two or three strokes, and you'll see kind of this dull metal just immediately become polished and shiny. You can see yourself in it. Oh, uh, cereal boxes, pasteboard, you know, food container, 
cardboard, that also works very well as a, uh, as a strop. The compound is what's doing the cutting. The strop is simply there to hold the compound. So you don't need to get really freaky about the material that you're using. You literally can make these yourself. And you don't need to strop for three days. Two, three, maybe five strokes, and you're done. Then you test for sharp. How? Everybody has their own preferred methods. Um, I use my fingernail, and I do the stick test. That's where I'm taking the edge perpendicular into my thumb fingernail. I'm not trying to get my thumb off, but I'm making sure that when I give a little bit of pressure, that edge bites into the fingernail. Not through it. It's not that sharp. I'm not, not using that much force, but it just kind of bites in. Then, and this is one that you may or may not want to do, but it's something Roy Underhill talked about in, in one of his uh, uh, shows that any apprentice for a cabinet maker, a wheelwright, a uh, uh, timber framer, the apprentice's job was to sharpen the tools. And the way they could tell if he did a good job is that the, the journeyman, the, the master, he would use his fingernail and run it along the edge of the tool and he would feel for nicks in the edge. And the fingernail would catch on those little nicks. Now, yeah, you could slice your finger open doing this. So I would suggest having some long fingernails, but that's what they were doing. And that's what I will do is I will look for any of those little tiny micros microscopic nicks that the sharpening process didn't get out. Or I'll shave some hair off my arm. Wife hates that. If you don't want to risk life and limb, you can also pick up a piece of pine, just normal, everyday, construction-grade pine, and try to shave end grain. Yeah, this is really, really tough. Pine is kind of a unique wood. It doesn't like to be cut with anything other than extremely sharp edges. It, it tends to crush. So if you can take a shaving off of end grain pine, you are sharp. If you're using an axe, just go ahead and crush the bloody thing. If you're sharpening a paring chisel, do this test to see if it is actually truly sharp. Now, here's the other thing that I think a lot of people are confused on because they've been watching the YouTube again. And they start to think that their tool is getting a little dull. It's, it's lost its edge and they are not sure what to do. Some people may go back to the 220 and start all over again. Please don't do this. All you need to do is to break out your strop, charge it with some more compound, take a few swipes on the strop, and voila, you are sharp again. Yet, don't need to go all the way back to the beginning. You're sharp. You've just lost that, that fine sharpness that the honing process gave you. Yeah, sometimes that will not work anymore and then drop down to your highest stone. You know, in my case, uh, you know, a 1200. Um, and then give that a few, a few licks and then go back to the honing process. And again, within two to three minutes, you're back, uh, back in business. Warning, warning. If you are in a relationship, if somebody lives in your household, if you're married, if you have a spouse, if you have a partner, if somebody uses the kitchen knives, warning, if you sharpen these knives, tell everyone in the household that you have sharpened the knives. Put up a sign, get a billboard, maybe one of those neon illuminated things. Let people know that you have sharpened 
your knives. I thought I was being a really good husband to my wife, and I took her prized Werther knives out into the shop, and I sharpened them all up. And yeah, I was I was taking hair off my arms. It was just falling off like a barber. Put them back in, and she went to make, I think it was a BLT sandwich, and picked up a tomato, and darn near sliced her fingertip off. Oh, was she mad. I mean, there was blood all over the tomato. Oh, it was just ugly. And I, of course, felt really bad having contributed to mutilation of my my lovely wife. Um, So be sure you tell people that you have sharpened the knives because, you know, you used a certain amount of force on that dull knife to cut the tomato. And when you use the exact same amount of force that you're used to using, but now you have an extremely sharp knife, yeah, she lost control of it and... We almost made a trip to the uh, to the ER. Okay, a couple more things, a couple recommendations. Uh, Rob Kosman, uh, YouTube star, he does a really wonderful job on explaining his sharpening system. Uh, it's different than what I have described. Uh, he uses two stones. He does sharpen by hand at a station. He uses a 300 grit and a 16,000 grit. That's it. Only two stones. Wonderful procedure. I'd encourage you to watch that. Also check out Paul Sellers. Uh, this is a gentleman in England. Um, let's see. How would I describe him? Uh, old school. He has some wonderful videos. Now he freehands at a workbench. He doesn't have the fancy sharpening station set up, but he is so tall. I mean, I think at the workbench, his arms are fully extended. And his technique is is more similar to mine, but it's still a little bit different. Um, so check out these videos. Search out everything on sharpeningsupplies.com. Give him a call. Talk to him. And I would encourage you that if you're really serious about doing this, Go out and buy a cheap set of chisels. I'm talking Harbor Freight. I mean, like 35 bucks for a set of, I don't know, four, six, something like that. These are your practice chisels. Go through your technique, sharpen them, drop them on the concrete floor, cut a nail in half with them, and start over. All the way from the shaping back up through the sharpening. This is how you will get good at doing this. And seriously, you're not going to really progress very far as a a quality woodworker until you learn to sharpen. Not trying to scare anybody, but offering some encouragement to dive in and tackle this. Maybe a good kick in the butt if that's what you need. Uh, Some news in woodworking. I think you would be interested in, you heard me earlier report about how the Consumer Safety Product Commission is in the process of making all table saws, anti-finger cutter offer saws, safety saws, so that you can no longer remove digits with your table saw, uh, basically by using some type of saw stop technology. SawStop announced that they are going to release their patented technology to the public. And that's about all they said. Because one of the big hang-ups here is that all the other companies are saying that, number one, we will not be able to develop the technology, our technology that is not in violation of any patents, within a three-year period that this is expected to go into effect, which means we're kind of out of the table saw business. Thank you, government. Well, SawStop said, nope, you can use use ours. Go right ahead. No other details were released, so we'll have to see how this plays out. And you remember an earlier episode where we talked about the Consumer Product Safety Commission and their changes to the laws regarding 
child safety and tip over regulations. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, one of the ways that they encourage manufacturers to help protect from tip overs was to use uh, safety straps some way of attaching a cabinet to a wall and everybody was using in essence these zip ties to accomplish this uh yeah <laughs> there's been a recall on those safety restraints yeah <laughs> seems like they're breaking cabinets are tipping over kids are still getting hurt so there you go miss jobs i had a gentleman ask if i would build him a f case for his fly rods Sounds like a wonderful idea. Um, I'm still working on mine that I started about like a dozen years ago. Um, I, I had to pass. I also had a lady call up just before I was ready to record uh, asking if I would re-glue a chair. And again, I just cannot take on any new work right now. So you guys need to get moving. Get your shingle out there. Let people know that you can repair chairs and build cases for fly rods and help meet the demand recommendations everything that we listed in here the uh, taylor drill press uh, sharpener uh, sharpening supplies.com rod costman uh, paul sellers and also the saw stop and the uh, restraint recall is all in the, sh uh, the show notes. Special thanks to listeners in Seattle, Washington, Melbourne, Australia, and a one listener in Poland. Thank you very, very much. If you'd like to support the show, you can buy me a cup of coffee, donate directly, or sign up for a coaching conference. You know, one hour, we can hash through some of the problems that you've kind of has you stumped. You're not sure how to uh, get this thing off the ground. I would be more than happy to help. So until next time, happy woodworking.